All I have that it's three o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, I'm Rebecca Wilson, and I'm a member of the Preservation Delaware Board and the Education Committee. I would like to thank all of the sponsors for their support of this conference. And before we actually begin the sessions, just a few reminders. We will take all questions at the end of the presentations, so please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have a problem, the chat is available for technical issues and information. All presentations are being recorded and will be available in a few weeks on PDI YouTube site. Our speakers for this Reinterpreting and Reimagining Historic Gardens are Linda Susky and Breton Grom. Detailed bios are available on both speakers on the program online. Linda is the board chair of the Arasafa Garden Club. She has extended on extensive research on the club and the Amstel House Gardens, a property of the Newcastle Historical Society. Breton is the director of the George Reed House and Gardens, a position he has held since 2018. Prior to that, he was the curator of special collections at the Delaware Historical Society's research library. He studied musicology at the Oberlin Conservative Music and Case Western University and American History and Material Culture at the University of Delaware. He is currently spearheading a renovation campaign in partnership with David Rubin Land Collective of Philadelphia to make the Reed House landscape environmentally, financially, and socially sustainable for the next generation. We'll begin with Linda. Thank you, and I'm delighted to see everybody here today. Let me get my screen up. Here we go. Um, Arasafa Garden Club and Newcastle Historical Society had a fascinating experience rehabilitating this garden in 2018. So I'm, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to share with you all our experience from it. First, for those of you who may not be familiar with historic Newcastle or the Amstel House, um, the Enstow House is a distinctive, important Georgian home built in 1738. It was acquired as a museum in 1929 by Newcastle Historical Society. Obviously, that's the Cliff Notes version of the Amstel House. The Amstel House Garden was created by the Brandywine and Wilmington Garden Clubs in the 1930s. And during this project, the two clubs merged. Um, it was created as a setting for the Emstow House Museum under the leadership of Jean Kane Folk DuPont, who's the woman pictured here. I love that picture. The garden was designed by Charles Gillette. I'm going to talk about him in a moment. And it is really a beautiful example of a 1930s colonial revival garden. And what is colonial revival? Let me give you a Cliff Notes version of that. Colonial revival is not intended to be truly authentic. Uh, authentically, the garden around the Amstel House would have been very much a working yard, growing fruits and vegetables and used for firewood and refuse, livestock. Um, colonial revival is an idealized version of colonial America. Two of the traits are that it's very formal and precise. This photo of the Amstel House, part of the Amstel House garden is, you can see it's very symmetrical. I'll show you a, a bird's eye view in a moment. Um, and this kind of garden with those little mandarin paths surrounded by boxwoods is called a parterre. Uh, other than in the parterre, Colonial Revival is known for having straight paths, not curved or meandering paths like you might see in an English garden. And there's often a focal point. And in the case of the Amstel House, it is a sundial on a baluster from a bridge in London. Colonial revival gardens typically have low walls and fences. And if you're looking at the um, images of the, um, the speaker and moderator on the right, you can see there's a low wooden fence but we think of the white picket fence as classic colonial revival. These two photos are not from the Amstel garden, 
and I'll explain why in a moment. But let me go back to Charles Gillette, who designed the garden. He, uh, in the early 20th century, designed over 780 gardens, the great majority of which were in Virginia. Only about five or six were in Delaware. So that makes the Amstel House Garden particularly important. Um, he was highly regarded as a landscape architect in the early 20th century, particularly known for colonial revival designs and what were called country place designs, those designs of gardens that would be on, on big estates and look a bit more natural. Um, he was also known for having innovative interpretations in the spirit of Georgian designs. Um, so he, he broke the rules a little bit and the phrase used for that is freedom within form. He was also known for dividing gardens into outside rooms that might be separated by paths or low hedges. Now, here's one of the ways that he broke the rules. He really liked to surround the entire garden with a high wall. Um, I, this was to block modern vehicles and sounds and give his gardens a really peaceful colonial feel where you really would feel that you're, you've stepped back in time. He also paid more attention to hardscaping rather than the specific plantings. And I have here four examples of the delightful hardscaping touches that he added to the Enstall House garden. Clockwise from the top left, the garden gates are designed by Gillette with that herringbone pattern. In the top right, you can see the herringbone pattern repeated on the brick walks. The little house in the back was what Gillette called a tool shed. The actual building was designed by Victorine Holmesy of Wilmington. Bottom right, he designed the gate latch, not just the, the gates themselves. And then on the bottom left, the brick walls flare out at the bottom. Um, they make them more attractive and it's also more, more stronger. That style was used in colonial times and he really admired it and tried to um, I emulate it. So he gave a lot of attention to hardscaping. Um, his plant specifications were often somewhat vague. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, the question facing anyone trying to save a historic property is, do you preserve, do you restore, do you rehabilitate? Preserving means trying to keep it exactly the way that it was. Restoring means trying to return it to how it once looked. Rehabilitation means modifying the property somewhat to meet changing realities while maintaining the historic character of the property. For historic gardens, unlike say buildings or furnishings, this is a pretty easy decision which route to go. Historic gardens cannot be preserved. Um, you have to think of a garden like a person. People grow, get older, eventually become sick, eventually they pass away. It's also true for plants and gardens. Plants grow, eventually become sick, eventually die. You can see these are some boxwoods that were once in the Amstel House garden. And you can tell from that big hole in the middle and the yellowish leaves, it's not a healthy plant. Um, another problem you run into is even before plants become sick, they simply grow too big for the, the setting that they were designed for. Um, sometimes plants are no longer available or suitable. A good example not applicable to the Amstel Garden is chestnut trees. If Gillette had specified a chestnut tree, we wouldn't be able to provide it now. So preservation is not a possibility. Restoration, taking the garden back to exactly how it looked when it was first planted in the 1930s may also not be feasible. Um, one of the big reasons for this is environmental changes. Uh, the, the example I have in this photo, this is a hackberry tree. This was planted in the 1930s. It has now become one of the oldest hackberry trees in Delaware. Obviously, we want to keep it, but also obviously it throws a lot more shade than it did back in the 1930s. There's now too much shade in the garden for many of the plants that Gillette specified. Um, another example of the reason why restoration may not be feasible is changing uses of the garden. When this rehabilitation was planned, 
Newcastle Historical Society wanted to use the grounds for private events. So it wanted more lawn space than in the original plan. And then finally, again, original plant varieties may now be unavailable or too costly to maintain. Here's an example. Um, Gillette really liked periwinkle, that ground cover that you see in a lot of gardens. It's now considered by Delaware to be an invasive species. So we could not plant it today. It's no longer sold in Delaware. So that's one kind of way we cannot return the garden to, way, to the way it once was. So really, I think for many historic gardens, rehabilitation is the way to go. But the challenge here is rehabilitation is not a once and done project. Because plants grow, age, and die, and environmental circumstances change, all the things I talked about before, historic gardens need rehabilitation about every 10 or 15 years. So it's sort of a continuous process. You get to enjoy the garden for a few years, and then you not need to start thinking about the next rehabilitation. Now, the 2018 re rehabilitation for the Amstel House Garden had three goals. The first one was to bring the gardens closer to Gillette's original plans. The second one was to introduce hardy, low maintenance plans because the garden costs thousands of dollars annually to maintain. We want to minimize that cost as much as possible. And then, as I explained, at that time, Newcastle Historical Society wanted to make the garden more conducive to site renovation, uh, to site rentals. So our process started by researching the original design. And here we were really lucky compared to many gardens because we have records of Gillette drawings. He did a total of 34 drawings. We think that's because the garden club kept changing its mind. Most of them are housed at the University of Virginia. We have two that you see pictured here. They were only done a few days apart. I think the real difference is the blueprint specifies more specific plants, but the one on the right, that's my favorite. It's just so pretty and I can look at it and imagine it. Um, I wanna point out, the, and I think the, the drawing on the right is the easier one to follow. Down in the bottom left corner, that is the Amstel house. Uh, the rectangle that's full of hatchings is a brick patio that's still there. The rest of the garden is divided into three rooms. Remember, that's a characteristic of Gillette. Bottom right is the bar parterre. And looking at it from this angle, you can see it was designed to look like a butterfly. Very unusual for a parterre. We're really proud of that. Then behind it is a large lawn area with what he called the tool shed in the back, we now call it a garden house. And then in the upper left, there are two brick walks that are horizontal that are cutting through it. He intended that to be a fanciful version of a kitchen garden with cutting flowers and fruit trees, never really a productive kitchen garden. So obviously these were extremely helpful to us. We also, researched records of the original installation. And here again, we were really fortunate that a number of years ago, the Brandywine, well, the Wilmington Garden Club um, shared with us records from the Brandywine and Wilmington Garden Clubs. Remember they merged in the 1930s. One of the things we learned from researching those records is we were wondering why is there that stone cap on that wall that Gillette installed? It turned out that he researched colonial era gardens in the Wilmington area and found that this was a trait of Wilmington gardens to have that stone cap. So that's why it's included there. It's also important to recognize that none of Gillette's plans, those dozens of plans was ever completely installed. One big reason is that the area in the upper left of the drawing that was supposed to be that fanciful kitchen garden at the time the garden was installed, there were two small buildings there. There was a cobbler all the way in the upper left corner. And then right just past the Amstel house, there was the town water office that ran the water and you can see a photo of it. That water office was not demolished until 1972, 35 years after the garden was first installed. Um, so the wall 
and landscaping were completed then, but that whole kitchen garden was never really installed. Also, way up at the top, there's a, a long brick walk that goes all the way to the top of the drawing. It's hard to read, but it says, well, he wanted to put a little colonial revival type well. That was never installed. I suspect cost was probably an issue there. The next thing we did was actually research Charles Gillette himself. Remember, he did hundreds of garden designs. Um, we wanted to learn about his philosophy, and we wanted to see other gardens that he designed. This is a photo of one of the gardens that Gillette did in Virginia. Um, and again, it may be hidden by the photos of the presenters and moderators here, but there's an arbor that we decided to include in the Amstel House garden. Also, you can see that, remember, there's that focal point, and it looks like another sundial. That bed is surrounded by little bricks that are set going straight up, half emerging. Um, we learned that that was a trait that Gillette, he didn't specify it for the Amstel House, but he used that commonly. Um, we also decided to spend the money to have the proper property properly surveyed. It hadn't been done for many years, and we did learn that the wall that you see in the back of this photo um, is set in about a foot or two from the property line. Fortunately, our neighbor behind the wall, uh, she was actually a member of the club and on the board. They were very easy to work with, but we felt it was good to, to establish legally what was our property to work on. Now it was time to start engaging stakeholders on what the garden should look like. And uh, one of the big lessons we learned is that public gardens need stakeholder outreach. We had two main groups of stakeholders. Newcastle Historical Society is the owner of the property. Arisafa Garden Club has been caretakers of the property since 1937 and was funding the rehabilitation with support from the trustees of Newcastle Common. But those two stakeholders are not monoliths. They both have members. Um, every member has their own opinion. With the Historical Society, we especially engaged with the professional staff and their board members. With the Garden Club, there were a number of members who had devoted considerable time to caring for the garden and some were even had even been involved with the previous rehabilitation 10 or 15 years earlier. Um, some were just garden enthusiasts that had very strong opinions. So it was um, a lot of cooks in this kitchen. One of the things that the board, the Arasafa board decided to do was to engage a professional landscape architect to add credibility to the plans. And that really did help. Instead of just having a bunch of Arasafa members, garden enthusiasts get together and talk, having a professional did lend credibility to the plans. Um, we also, um, as I mentioned, had stakeholders with a very strong opinions, so much so that I will tell you, some of us called the design consultation process the Great Boxwood Wars. And these two photos explain the issue. Um, on the left is a photo from the late 1930s, so very shortly after Gillette's original design was installed. And you can see that the butterfly parterre was edged with teeny tiny little boxwoods edging the paths. Now on the right, you see the boxwoods before the rehabilitation. The ones in the middle actually had been installed only a few years earlier. Boxwoods grow really fast. They need to be severely sheared annually or they get out of control. Um, but the ones we were really concerned about were the ones edging the entire garden along that brick wall. They were probably installed in the 1950s. And we found that some of the folks associated, especially with Newcastle Historical Society, of course, they want to preserve things. That's their business. Um, and so there were some people that felt the boxwoods should be kept simply because they were old. They go back to the 1950s. So we ended up compromising, and I'll show you in a moment what we how we compromised. There were some elements of Gillette's design that we were able to restore. Um, in the last rehabilitation, a fairly large perennial garden had been installed along the wall leading up to the garden house um, and a gravel path had been put in 
Um, the path was not part of Gillette's path plan. He did not use gravel paths, he used brick paths. So we removed that, made the perennial garden much smaller so it was easier to maintain and more in keeping with his design. And you can see those upright bricks that we added, just like he um, did as one of his hallmarks. Another thing we did was remove the plantings in front of the garden house. He did not have any plantings in front, and we think that the right photo is what it looks like today. Better showcases the garden house, which is really delightful. Um, and as you can see, we did get those big boxwoods pulled and replaced with smaller boxwoods around the parterre. What we did was retain some of the older boxwoods around other parts of the garden. One of the big changes was the dividing line between the room that is the parterre in the front and the lawn and the garden house in the back. You can see on the left how huge those boxwoods had gotten over the years. Um, Gillette called for only two fairly large boxwoods in the center of that long bed. And you can see one of the new ones next to the arbor. And he specified small boxwoods and perennials. And we now have, those are uh, daffodils in the spring. We have daylilies in the summer, which works much better with the design. He also specified um, two um, apple trees, and you can just barely make out one of them. It's a crab apple. So another way that we returned it to Gillette's design. There were some things that we could not restore. The cutting flower garden and the fruit trees could not be put in, partly because that's now a fairly shady area, but also because at that time, Newcastle Historical Society wanted um, more lawn space for events. He specified a lot of lilacs under the hackberry tree. It's now too um, shady under the hackberry tree for those lilacs. He specified roses in the butterfly parterre. We now know that not only are roses very temperamental and expensive to maintain, but their roots would interfere with the roots of the boxwoods, who are also, which are also expensive and temperamental to maintain. Um, a few other plantings here and there were no longer feasible, but those were the big ones. We did make a couple of changes. Um, the brick wall of our neighbor's house looked just really plain at one end of the butterfly parterre. So we decided to put in trellises and um, Gillette used trellises a lot in other gardens. So it was in keeping with his, um, I think he wouldn't have minded if that we added those. And then we added um, two arbors. And remember, I, uh, there was we saw arbors in other gardens of Gillette that we researched. The one change is he typically had them painted white to keep maintenance costs down. We left them as natural wood. So the lessons that we learned, first of all, research as much as you can what your garden looked like or possibly looked at. Um, if you are, don't know much about it, look at other gardens in the area from that time period to try to get some ideas. We learned that garden rehabilitation is more feasible than preservation or restoration. Um, think about a property survey. I think it's a smart idea if one hasn't been done for a while. And if your garden is public, hire a professional landscape architect, consult with key stakeholders, and be prepared to compromise. Um, and little promotion here, please visit the Amstel House Garden we have here at the website of um, where you can get a self-guided tour and more information. And let me now turn it over to Brenton. Uh, the website for info on the Amstel House Garden has just been posted in chat. Thank you, Linda. I am um, shuffling windows in my screen here and momentarily I ought to be able to share with you a set of slides. All right, are we showing? Are we are we in business? Looking good. Good. Um, well, it's inspiring to hear about a project that's um, 
uh, on its back end. We are, as you heard, um, just in the process of undertaking a major rethinking of our gardens at the Reed House. And it sounds like um, Linda and I are in agreement that the problem with gardens is that they grow. Um, it's a problem in the most crass economic sense of the word, um, which is that it takes resources to prevent nature from reclaiming the designs that humans have imposed on the landscape. Um, and in fact, as many of you probably know, this is why the gardens at Winterthur languished for a number of years after Henry Francis DuPont died in 1969. Um, no one had quite realized how much money and attention he was personally devoting to those naturalistic gardens long after the house was already operating as a museum. And so it came as um, a bit of a surprise. On a far smaller scale, my own institution, the Delaware Historical Society, is having its own reckoning with the grounds of the George Reed II House. Oops. Uh, as you may or may not know, the Reed House is a National Historic Landmark. Uh, it was built between 1797 and 1804 for the son of a founding father. It's a premier example of federal period architecture. Uh, it's surrounded by gardens that were laid out actually a generation later by the second owner in 1847. And when Lydia Laird, its last private owner, died in 1975 and left the property to DHS, the gardens were um, fairly overgrown. First came a restoration of the house in the 1980s, um, and then eventually a garden campaign in the 90s. And there were volunteers doing the maintenance after that, um, but they dwindled over time, which is a somewhat familiar story. And a few months after I arrived here in 2018, the last of them finally disbanded. There was at that point no allocation, zero allocation for professional horticultural care in our annual operating budget. And we've begun to change that. Uh, we've also established an endowed fund for the ongoing maintenance of the gardens. Um, but some of the motion began in 2019 when Anna Wick created a management plan for us. Um, we now, as of um, maybe five or six months ago, have a really excellent part-time gardener, um, Ann Barry, who has been rescuing the gardens um, from some of their roughest days uh, while we think about uh, long-term design. But at this point, they do need major rehabilitation. Uh, the tree canopies have changed, the plantings are competing with one another, uh, plantings have reached the ends of their lifespans, uh, root systems are challenging um, other parts of the landscape, um, specifically the hardscape. And so um, there are areas that independently of the maintenance issues just no longer make sense from a design perspective. Uh, so the gardens right now badly need editing and they need um, rejuvenation across the board. I felt pretty lousy about that for a while um, after I arrived until uh, one day a neighbor across the street said, look, I've, I've lived here as long as the society has owned this property, actually a couple of years longer, and it has never been able to get its arms around the maintenance. Um, and that's when it became clear to me that we had to make this problem bigger in, all the, in order to solve it. And when I say problem, I don't just mean the administrative problem of figuring out how to provide for maintenance. I also mean problem the way that academics in the humanities often use that word, um, meaning a question that is to be considered, thoughtfully probed, tested, uh, put into context. We sometimes talk about problematizing an idea or a condition or an assumption as a way of stripping away the conventional wisdom that can get in the way of gaining some kind of insight or understanding that carries us forward. And so when I say the problem is that the gardens grow, I'm interested in how they push up against the premises of historic preservation. People tend to tinker with their private gardens at home all the time. Uh, when it comes to civic landscapes, a park, a public square, it's also not unusual to see changes in design once every generation or two, whether that's a matter of aesthetics or um, rethinking of what the community's contemporary needs are and how that landscape can serve them. Uh, but a private landscape that at some point then opens to the public is I think a whole other story. 
usually it goes something like this. There's a privileged space that is somehow beautiful or interesting or restorative or significant for its design, um, maybe all of the above. I think the Reed House and the Amstel House Gardens both qualify as, as all of the above. Um, and then that space gets offered up from being a private space, offered up for the public good so that a wider group of people can now benefit from what was previously available only to just a few. It removes the barriers for access. All of which comes with a giant presumption that the thing being accessed is worth hanging on to in its current state, that it's worth preserving. And now I'm not questioning that value, but as we all know here, there are practices for preserving architectural fabric that can keep a building looking more or less the same way for quite a long time. But landscapes, on the other hand, through the forces of ecological, uh, you know, progress are a lot more slippery and vulnerable than buildings are. They resist stasis. Plants grow and they change and they die, even when they're acted upon according to the very best horticultural practices. And so at the Reed House, part of making the garden problem bigger, so to speak, is asking ourselves uh, and asking our stakeholders, what's the significance of this landscape that we are stewarding? And spoiler alert, um, for a statewide historical society that's operating in a town like Newcastle, the consensus is pretty much um, that the value is the historicity um, of that property. So then why don't we just restore things to the way that they were, so to speak, um, or at least uh, in this business, what we call um, a period of significance. I mean, what a loaded term, right? Period of significance. The archeology span reflects thousands of years of human activity on this land. And I'm stealing a graphic from my colleague, uh, Andrea Anderson at the University of Delaware, who has done a lot of archeological work um, here. Um, this is, um, this, this, this entire area is Lenape Hoking, where uh, Lenape ancestors had a thriving culture and economy uh, and all of the human complexities that go along with that none of which is evident now above the surface of the ground. And you might say, okay, sure, um, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but you might say, fine, um, the opportunity for historical stewardship today is that there are structures and environments above the ground wrought by people who came after the Lenape. And because those material artifacts are still visible, uh, we have a chance to preserve them, to keep them from disappearing. And I'm afraid I have tough news on that front. What's filtered down to us is a mishmash of so many layers that it's tough to separate out just one of them, even if we can see parts of many of them. Uh, maybe palimpsest is a better word, more elegant word than mishmash, but um, forgive me for waxing chronological for a moment. I wanna give you um, the fairly complicated rundown of the history of this place. As we all know, Dutch settlers in the 1650s, followed by the Swedes and then the Englishmen laid claim to Newcastle. And the conflict and disease that that brought to uh, the Lenape decimated their population and it pushed many of them westward and northward. The house that George Reed I rented for almost 40 years um, was an old, an old Dutch dwelling house that stood where the parterre garden of um, the George Reed II house is today. He was constantly making improvements to that house and its surroundings, and he deducted all the costs from his rent. Uh, he turned it into a modest gentleman's house, consistent with the times, which is to say there were markers of gentility but the overall picture was nowhere near as picturesque as the colonial revival has conditioned us to um, imagine that it might have been. Reed, lay, uh, Reed added um, a number of layers of fill to both his yard and the waterfront lot across the street. Um, and there were little symbols of status like grafted apple trees um, or tulips that were the pride of his wife, Gertrude Reed. But it was a swept yard, it was dirt. Uh, trash disposal was by a method that um, Luanne de Conza likes to refer to as uh, throwing your refuse out back and walking on it for a generation or two. So it may or may not align with your expectations if you see 
colonial, quote unquote, colonial uh, Newcastle today. At the end of the century, along comes Reed Jr. He's a US attorney in his 30s with uh, pretty grandiose ambitions. And his father finally purchases the property along with the adjacent lots. And the father and the son, uh, together with a couple of brothers in Philadelphia, start planning what would become the largest and the grandest house in Delaware at that time. The younger Reed was also of his generation. Uh, dwellings and gardens uh, for America's elite at the turn of the 19th century were becoming more rarefied, more fully beautified. The architecture of the house was based on the William Bingham House in Society Hill, which was the first real arrival of neoclassicism in American urban, uh, uh, urban mansion architecture. And Bingham had an extensive garden as well that was walled off from the street. People, uh, we're told, um, would peek through uh, the gates to get a glimpse at it. It was not public. Reed seems like he wanted to do the same thing. He poked around with Bernard McMahon, a uh, celebrated gardener in Philadelphia, about what it would cost to establish and maintain pleasure gardens on his property. And it amounted to a big fat nothing. Uh, Reed's finances were already pretty overextended on the, on the lavish house he had built. And as far as we can tell, the space that we now think of as the main garden on this property was mostly utilitarian through the end of the Reed years of ownership. There was a kitchen garden, a wood pile, a stable, probably a blacksmith shop. Um, and yet he took care um, on the front side, on the street side of the house, to have a row of Lombardy poplar, uh, poplars planted along the street. Um, it was a very fashionable thing to do at that moment as public landscapes um, like Center Square in Philadelphia were starting to emerge as more refined landscaped spaces. There's also a watercolor rendering by William Birch, the celebrated artist and landscape designer from Philadelphia. Um, it shows the most sublimely elegant design for the waterfront lot. And mind you, the Newcastle waterfront at this point was a bustling place. There were wharves, uh, commercial activity. This was a deliberate insertion, a rewriting of the land to connect Reed's ambitions and his new mansion to the Delaware River, probably in the same way um, that Philadelphia's summer houses um, along the Schuylkill River had these terraced lawns that rambled down to the water. So did Reed commission it or was it done on speculation? Hard to say, um, but ground penetrating radar um, and a few shovel test pits that Luann and her team have, um, have worked with a number of years ago seem to show at minimum that there are some bricks down there beneath the surface that don't seem like they could have gotten into that arrangement by themselves. So it's tantalizing to think uh, that maybe at least some part of this landscape was installed on the land, if not um, you know, the part that's designed as an idyllic island off of the shore. When the property went up for sale in 1846, the buyer was a Newcastle native named William Cooper. Uh, Cooper had made his fortunes in trading in Canton and Macau, and then he came back and retired in his hometown. He hired Robert Buist, um, a well-known Philadelphia nurseryman at that time, to beautify the main lot in ways that Reed had never been able to accomplish. And by then, the elder Reed's old house um, had burned down, and in its place, uh, Buist installed a formal flower garden next to the house with low boxwood borders. Um, it's the, the basis for what we call the parterre garden today. Beyond it, um, in this diagram, you can see there was a section that was more um, romantic and curvilinear. It was filled with specimen plantings, um, to our best understanding. And then at the back of the garden, there was, um, again, the more utilitarian space. There was a kitchen garden. So when Philip and Lydia Laird um, became the last private owners of this place in 1920, they kept a lot of what they found from the Cooper years. But the adjustments that they made uh, certainly tell us something about the world that they lived in. You no longer needed a kitchen garden at your own home. Um, so the most utilitarian section of that Cooper garden became for the Lairds a place of leisure. Um, it's kind of bower enclosed by grape and uh, rose arbors with 
a pool and a pool house uh, that was designed by Lausette Rogers. Uh, the gravel paths throughout the garden became brick paths, um, which helped to reconcile this mid 19th century garden with the overwhelming focus on colonial era streetscapes that was um, starting to sharpen um, in Newcastle's existing fabric um, as kind of a historical fantasy at that time. And if there's one key to understanding the Lairds and their world, it's that preservation and play were never very far apart. At the river's edge, they built a yacht basin uh, with their cousin Irene Dupont Sr., who uh, lived at Grenogue, and um, Irene's son, uh, Irene Jr., who still lives at Grenogue, in fact, at age 102, uh, spent his teenage years hanging around the boats. Um, as, um, as Mr. DuPont summed it up a few years ago, the Lairds were a fun and attractive couple who entertained a lot. Um, he described their interests as, quote, historic preservation and social drinking. Um, the parties in their colonial themed tap rooms in the basement uh, of the Reed House were legendary. And maybe even more to the point, in um, the hand painted wallpaper that they commissioned for their dining room in the 1920s, the sketches, the preliminary sketches, show this, con this conscious process of narrating a certain slice of history through um, a depiction um, of the Newcastle streetscape. So what do we do with this deeply complicated cultural landscape? On one hand, there are incredible erasures. Certainly, certainly the Lenape have um, vanished from the landscape, but so is the Reed period effectively, um, which creates a really odd uh, disconnect between this house that is venerated as a piece of architecture from the early 19th century and the landscape that's around it. But I mean, let's be real, who wants to create a privy pit or a dirt yard? Um, that would only, I think, add to what's so startling um, about the disconnect between the grounds and the house. And so after DHS finished creating staged museum rooms inside the house that were suggestive of the Reed years, they fast forwarded then to the Cooper years outside uh, because that's the origin, so to speak, of the path system and the segmentation that we see in the garden plan today. And yet, um, to turn an old adage upside down, sometimes the more things stay the same, the more they change. There's almost no documentation from the 1840s. Um, so it was tall order that the society was taking on. The first photographs actually date to the 1880s and the 1900s, 40 and 50 years after the gardens were first planted. Um, and as we know, plants change and so do people's tastes. Um, and these photographs show it. You can see um, even in the span of time between the mid 1880s and the early 20th century, um, you can see that the spaced out plantings are starting to move closer together toward a more painterly kind of cottage garden effect. Um, we see that an, um, a hedge of um, arborvitae disappears, which leads us to ask, was it even an original feature to begin with? 40 or 50 years is a long time for things to happen. And by the early 20th century, the water lot was almost three times as deep as when George Reed the first started filling it in in the 1760s. Uh, you can see in this diagram um, from the ground penetrating radar that was done, um, the, the succession of fill campaigns um, that moved the water line very much further out. But, but this waterfront um, is a reminder that there can be a continuity of spirit, even as the surface of the landscape changes. So we're talking about rising sea levels and flood mitigation in 2022. But in fact, those fill campaigns were in response to destructive storms that happened over the years. George Reed, the first, even constructed a drywall at the water's edge back in the 1760s to hold back water and debris to the best extent that he could. Reportedly, the waves would lap up against the foundation of his house um, during the particularly bad storms. And um, allegedly, when the tide was in at high, 
one carriage wheel as you were driving along the street would often be in the water. So is it possible, is it possible that the simplicity of Birch's uh, 1805 design was actually a clever way to absorb storm surges? I don't know, maybe that's reading too much into it, but it's, it's tempting to think about that. Design is such an important part of the history of this landscape um, that it could in fact be our key to the future. Um, if we zoom back from the larger intellectual question about authorship and change and who's responsible for what and how to disentangle it, design takes us back to the pressing problems of infrastructure and maintenance. Even in the landscape, as it's sort of divided up today, we see places where, where nature is left to be to its own devices, and then places where it's been modified a little bit more by human hands, and places especially concentrated around the house where it's so tightly controlled through, um, through the architecture of the house or through the formality of the garden spaces. What if, looking toward the future, or, um, and this is purely speculative, don't go and tell anybody this is what we're um, gonna go and do to the water lot. But what if there were a meadow instead of a lawn with mown paths and that would reduce carbon emissions and provide some buffer for storm surges. And at the same time, it would actualize Birch's idyllic island um, and bring it onto the land um, as this attainable gathering place that could be, in theory, as powerful as those boozy uh, yacht basin times during the Laird uh, DuPont um, uh, sort of golden years at the waterfront. And all of this, while pointing visitors' attention from the highly contrived area around the house and the formal garden toward that first nature in the wetland species that are restoring themselves right now as we speak within the bounds of the former yacht basin. It's exciting. In last year's bond bill, the uh, Delaware General Assembly made us a generous appropriation to support improvement to the Reed House Gardens. And rather than just dig into deferred maintenance, we decided first um, to make the problem bigger, to invest a part of that funding in a potentially transformative partnership with David Rubin and his award-winning firm, known as Land Collective. They are based in Philadelphia and Indianapolis. They have done projects from um, the uh, campus of the Indianapolis Museum of Art to Winterthur to Franklin Park and the World War I Memorial in uh, Washington, DC. Um, and together with, with David and his team, we have been sizing up the incredible body of scholarship that we've amassed on these gardens um, over the years, over the last mm, 30 years or so. Um, and we've been squaring that with a series of community conversations to find out what people know about this landscape, what they feel about it, what they would like to see, what they would not like to see. Um, and Land Collective is actually anticipating um, delivering a set of concept renderings for design uh, sometime early next year. Much like what goes on inside the house these days, we're okay if there's a little bit of complexity that ends up in this design. Maybe not everything needs to be about surface level replication of what we think was once in a particular spot at a particular time. I know that sounds almost like blasphemy. We've done business that way for a long time, but hear me out. Maybe beautiful contemporary design, if we deploy it the right way, carefully, judiciously, Maybe design can actually help to frame the key points for historical thought and historical conversation that exists in this landscape. In the spirit of the Laird's historical imagination, um, in the dining room and the tap rooms and the gardens, that's what we already do with the house when we collaborate with artists who imagine themselves into the narratives of the interiors or who draw attention to um, the uh, architectural details in ways that we haven't noticed before. We see all of the imperatives of um, our community uh, stakeholders manifesting, manifesting themselves through creativity, 
and it's beautiful work. This is also what we do with our visitors now on ordinary house tours. Um, we invite them to appreciate the beauty of these spaces first. We don't rush them into, you know, telling them things that we want them to remember and walk away and be able to recite. We let the beauty sink in. We let the sight lines come through, the details. And then their relationship um, to the place starts to unfold on another level. They find opportunities, we find, um, to take a closer look and to start to unravel complicated human dynamics behind the materials that they are seeing. And if they can form that kind of empathy with people in the past, our bet is that they've also deepened their ability to empathize with their neighbors in contemporary life. What if the landscape could lead people toward the same kinds of experiences? So that axis in the house, that's so inspiring. You look through the parlors and you see the gardens in the back through one window, you see the river through the other. Land Collective is positing that maybe there could be multiple threads that follow along that axis. And this is just, you know, very conceptual. We, we are in the process of figuring out design-wise what that actually would look like manifested in the landscape. But what if there were a strand that somehow brought back to life the indigenous um, uh, population who commanded this space uh, hundreds of years ago? Um, and that period went back thousands of years and we could reach for that kind of depth to our landscape. What if uh, the inhabitants of the house, whether it was the owners of the house, the people who worked in the house over the years, um, could have some footprint here? What if we could pull out specifically African-American strands to the narratives here? Because the Delaware Historical Society is one of few um, that has a dedicated center for African-American heritage. And there's so much that is hidden at this point. There's a picture from a 1901 House and Garden article um, of an African-American gardener. There was a succession of a few of them during the Cooper period. Um, this might be a guy named Aaron Ross who worked in this role for about 30 years. If anybody, he would have been the guy um, at the center of either preserving or transforming the original plan of that garden. And certainly he was instrumental to transmitting the narrative of that original design um, to this writer from House and Garden in 1901. And that formed the basis of um, a lot of our understanding about the original details about the garden, which are not otherwise documented. That's a thread that has been forgotten. What if we could bring that back? And then what if we acknowledged stewardship of this place over the years, not just by the, ple the people who owned it, by all, but also by um, us as an or organization who have um, you know, had charge of this place for a half century now? Uh, what could all of this make if it were woven together? And I'm going to leave you at that cliffhanger. Um, I'm going to invite you to join the process of figuring this out. It's happening right now. We've been through a couple of community meetings. We've got another one um, coming up, uh, which we'll announce shortly. Um, and we're having conversations about all of this. Um, you can go to the website, readhouseandgardens.org slash landscape um, to learn more about the project or learn more about Land Collective um, and to make sure that you are on the mailing list to join in these conversations. Um, so I want to thank you for listening, um, and this seems like a great place to continue the conversation with a special um, opportunity to, you know, have some dialogue between the Amstel House Garden and the, and the, uh, the Reed House uh, Gardens here in Newcastle. So um, thank you all, and um, I believe now we move officially into the Q&A. Linda, do you want to unmute? Yes. Uh, and okay, great. Um, thank you both. They were wonderful um, talks about the two gardens and what you had to go through to get them and where you might be going in the future. Breton, we had a question about what kind of stone is the cap on the brick wall at the Amstel House? Oh, that's that's me. 
And the answer is I, I have a brain freeze. I'm actually doing this from California. All my notes are at home. But um, there are a few other members of Arasaf Garden Club that are here. And if I'm thinking Joan Appleby or Sue Hannell, if you know what that stone is, if you could put it in the Q&A, that'll educate all of us. I'm thinking limestone, but I could be wrong, so don't quote me. Okay. Breton, do you have a timetable for when you might begin um, the actual landscaping portion? You said you're still in the uh, research um, and having input from the public. Is there a deadline for that and where you expect to go next? Yeah, we, if, if things go according to plan, we expect to have um, a concept design by um, probably the late winter, early spring of next year. And we have reserved some of that grant money from the state of Delaware um, to, um, to help us implement some kind of pilot phase of construction. And obviously it's gonna depend on where we end up design wise as to how we would phase this project, what we would start with, but obviously we'd be looking at what could make uh, the greatest impact and attract people to um, wanna support the project going forward. I mean, don't quote me on this, but it's, it's tempting to think that at some point later in 2023, we could, you know, see a shovel hit the soil, um, and that would be an exciting moment of transformation. Okay. If that were the case, would you be sharing, you know, um, some of these plans that you come up with in your public um, viewing and? Is that going to happen like in a three month time if you hope to start to have a design by late winter? Uh, yeah, um, so bit by bit, the engagement meetings are turning from, what are your thoughts on the Reed House landscape to what do you think about this idea or this idea? So the last one we had, um, um, had sort of a voting exercise where there were large panels that had little representative uh, pictures describing different possible features. So, you know, in the um, parterre garden as it exists, is it important to you that we have boxwood? Is it important that we have formalized plantings? Would you like to see some native species introduced? Um, would you like to see um, the swimming pool brought back? Um, way in the back, or would you like to have it open as an event space? Um, at the next meeting we have, Land Collective is going to bring some specific I design ideas and say, you know, how does this sit with you? Can we have your feedback? Um, and then at some point um, toward the, the, probably the mid to late winter, we're going to have a final meeting where we reveal the, um, the design that's put, been put together with input along the way. And um, everyone gets to have that ooh and ah moment and then we're off and running from there. Linda, do you have any further plans maybe to add some more things to the garden or do you feel that at this point in time it is what it will be with just maintenance um, for the future? Well, uh, the only issue that's come up is it turns out that one of those arbors was um, poorly constructed and it's falling apart and needs to be replaced. Um, so that's the only real project. The um, I mentioned that that, that garden, we also, uh, Arasafa Garden Club also uh, takes responsibility for funding the maintenance and improvement of the Dutch House Garden. And between the two of them, it is thousands of dollars. An awful lot of it goes towards preserving those old trees and shrubs. They have to get evaluated on an annual basis by an arborist and they all need treatments. Um, we also have irrigation because um, a lot of, you know, we still have lawns and that was a characteristic of colonial revival gardens. Um, that's something I could see evaluating at some future point. Um, but other than that, fingers crossed that, you know, we don't have any upcoming expenses. Um, we saved a long time to fund that rehabilitation. And right now, our, our, our priority is just rebuilding our coffers. Mm 
Well, thank you both um, for your talks. We look forward to coming and seeing the sites and I hope everyone will go to Old Newcastle, see the new rehab of the Amstel House Gardens and keep in touch with the Historical Society, Delaware Historical Society's plans for the future of the Reed House. Again, thank you everyone. And their presentations will be up on the YouTube webinar in a couple of weeks from Preservation Delaware. Thanks, Rebecca. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all so much um, for that. That was fascinating. And yeah, looking forward to coming to visit and seeing uh, what happens next. So our next presentation is going to start at 4.15. So we've got a little bit of a break here. Um, go and stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee, um, but I hope you can join us at 4.15. We're gonna close this Zoom room um, so we can give our next presenters some time to log in and get settled um, and ready for their presentation, but you can use the same link uh, to log in at 4.15 that you used for this presentation. So thanks again to all of our speakers and thanks to our attendees. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, Alex, this is great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thank you.